awesome. Welcome everybody to this really exciting night for us here at Champion P Team Performance. Even though none of us are actually at Champion right now, we're all at home because we're doing this in the evening. But we are here celebrating our 200th episode of the podcast, which we are super excited about. So it's it's one of those things that's funny. So Lenny and I were texting with one of our friends, Dan Lorenz, which you guys might know. He's He's got uh, uh, dry humor on Twitter and uh, is always right. tweeting some really cool things. But um, uh, he, he said, like, hey, congrats on the podcast. He's like, you know, it, it speaks a lot that you guys, you know, uh, you know, you've been doing it for so long. There's so much competition out there with, like, different people out there that you guys made it to 200. And I was like, oh, Dan, just because we have 200 episodes doesn't mean anybody's actually listening, right? We just keep – we just were prolific with keeping it up. But nobody's listening to any of our podcasts. So, but no, in, in all honesty, we're here because of you, of everybody on this call right now. You're the reason why we're here. We, we started this. All of us have like a presence online, right? Like, you know, everybody here. I guess I, I should make the intros too. I don't know how this is going to look on the recording, but again, Lenny Macrina. Awesome. <laughs> Lenny Macrina is here. <laughs> Mike Scaduto down there, this like like mega Brady Bunch board here. Dave Tilly, Dan they called me twice, there. and then way, I denied they called me. Can't tell. <laughs> way uh, way over there, Lisa Russell. These, this is our PT crew at Champ PT nice. Performance. And yeah, they were clearly foreign. But. We um, Nick, we I, we may have to mute somebody. Is somebody not muted? I'm gonna. I see a lot of people that are unmuted. Nick. Gotcha. I, uh, uh, let me see so where I can. I just muted a couple of them, but but we we're all here. We all have like a big online presence. But you know what we said like a few years back? We actually said, look, we write blog posts, we do social media posts, we put stuff out there. It's what we're thinking. It's what we are doing, and 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 and, and want to teach you right at that time. But we said, what if we completely flip this? And you guys ask us the questions. Instead of us just force feeding what we're thinking right now, we want to answer the questions that you guys might have. And that's why we started this podcast now four years ago. It's been four years. been doing it almost every week, right? I mean, we do it uh, probably 50 weeks out of the year, just skipping a couple holidays. So, um, so we did this for you. And I can't tell you how humbling it is to, to be still doing it four years later and, and get all going. So I want to start it off with this. I want to start off with the toast right? So if you have a beverage, I know you do, Dirk. If you got a beverage, if everybody's out there, <laughs> if, we, we, were, we were thinking about going uh, all for this. I'm going to do a toast. And this toast is to you guys. It's to the listeners, the people that watch us on YouTube, the subscribers to our podcast. It's to you. Thank you for being here for us because the fact that you keep submitting questions to us is why we keep doing it every week and answering it. So thank you so much for that. Uh -huh. I can I gotta have a salute. salute. So, without further ado, let's get right into it. We're gonna start going a little bit more into, um, you know, like faster paced questions. Like, you know, we can all talk for a half hour about one topic, but if you have something, type it in the chat box. Let us know what you want to talk about. Try to keep it like, you know, like a not crazy, like what's your philosophy on fitness, right? Like try to keep it a little bit more specific so we can, uh, we can have some, some really quick, cool answers. Everybody ready? I like it. Let's do this. All right, Nick, who's first? All right. I'm going to unmute Matt Miller. What's up, guys? What's up, yeah. Matt? Oh, oh, perfect. What's hi. up? I see you in there. Matt, how what you doing? What's going on, man? How, what, what can we answer for you? Uh, so my question was, uh, uh, a lot of the weighted ball stuff that I've been reading about and you guys talked about seems to be the benefits are getting that increased layback, the external rotation aspect of it, uh, which also puts more pressure on the UCL, obviously. My question was, is there a way to maintain uh, a normal or safe level of layback while also increasing the, the strength or the stability of the internal rotator muscles uh, to kind of have the best of both worlds where you get that velocity increase, but also uh, kind of protect or decrease the stress on the UCL. 
I like it. All right. Yeah, I'll start off with that one. And and I, I can tell you right now that Dave Tilly's excited. We're starting this off with a baseball question. Dude, so I'm fired we, up. We, 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 Obviously. We, we've uh, oh Indians. Just wake Let's, me up in an hour. Got the Indians on. Baseball. <laughs> a- AL Central <laughs> rivals right there. So well, I'll I'll start it off with this. So what we're finding with the science of weighted balls right now is that they they work probably by increasing that layback, like you said. That is good and bad, right? And, and what we found over the course of our studies is that not that just like layback goes up, but it goes back, it goes up dramatically and quickly. Like in an acute setting, we had people that use heavy balls, like the one, two pound balls, even at partial effort throws, they'd go up over five degrees of external rotation acutely. So, you know, it's interesting, like what's happening, right? Are they stretching something out? Are they tearing something? I, I don't know. Maybe chronically they are, but what they're probably doing is desensitizing the GTO. So then what happens is they have all that layback and they throw on it and you're taking an activity that is already extreme force and speed at end range and you're making it worse. So it, they're dangerous to an extent. Now, that doesn't mean they're not effective, and it doesn't mean you can't, you can't use them, right? A five-ounce ball is, is somewhat dangerous too. I think it all comes down to the dose. But I, a lot of people are saying, like, like what, what can we do? Like, is doing that beneficial? Do you strengthen the ligament like that? I don't think a ligament, like, adapts like a bone does with Wolf's Law, for example. Like, and there's some recent studies coming out right now that actually show that a UCL over the course of the season gets engulfed but probably in a bad way. So ultrasound is actually showing that if you diagnostically look at the UCL, there's actually some dark areas in there and it gets engulfed and large over the course of the season in a bad way. Uh, Lenny, would you add anything to that? No, I, I, I think you, you said it well. I think we're looking for that magic bullet versus, I know you know this, Matt, but like, you know, have we worked on everything, arm care and, and strengthening and, and uh, maintaining the range of motion and, yeah, in a perfect world, getting getting that laid back, but being able to work on subscap strengthening would be ideal, but I don't think it's that ideal. So I think we just need to, you know, it's going to be obviously individualized, and that's what we try to do a champion. And so that's that's what we, we use weighted balls, but not to the extent that I think other people are. So there's other things that we like to focus on. Awesome. Mike, did you have something too? Yeah, just quickly, I would say uh, you know, screening athletes before they start a weighted ball program can be huge. There are some people that I think would benefit more from a weighted ball program and some people that may benefit a little bit less. So if you have someone that already has 160 degrees of layback and you want to add some more on top of that, that may not be the best for that person. But if someone's a little bit stiff into external rotation, they may benefit from getting a little bit more. And then the other thing I would say is um, continue to monitor their external rotation as they go through the program. They start getting these really big jumps and it's not correlating with velocity or you think they're at a higher risk for injury. You can always back off the program or you can stop the program at that point. And think about it, right? Like it's just like anything else in medicine. If you're going to do something that is like as close to as max strength as we can, you got to monitor, right? Just like Mike said, you assess, reassess, you monitor the dosage. Thanks, Matt. Who's next, Nick? It's Matt. All it's right, Matt. we got Abby Gordon is next. <laughs> How does Abby all <laughs> these things? I mean, she's the second one. She's got a good question. What's up, Abby? Hey, guys. Um, I'm wondering okay. about any <laughs> tips for PTs who want to present more around the country or even bigger than that since you guys do that. Ooh, I like it. That's pretty good. Len, why don't you, like, I don't know, why don't you, why don't you start off with that one? How'd you get into presenting uh, – some stuff like that. And I'd kind of hear like, you know, maybe like Tilly and stuff like that. I know you, you've been kind of thinking about like doing more of that, but what do you, what are you guys thinking? Yeah. I mean, I, uh, I started off small, obviously, uh, probably like an in-service, <laughs> which everybody probably does. But um, at my facility that I was at in Birmingham, we did docs. We did talks with our docs every Monday, Thursday, and Friday. And um, so I somehow weaseled my way into do a talk and it was like an hour talk and you get, you get comfortable uh, people see you and then you do a second talk and then you get comfortable with that and you just, you just get to find that opportunity. You know what I mean? Whether it's doing something locally to the docs, um, but it shows interest. It shows that you care about the profession. You're trying to promote what you, what you guys are doing at your facility and educate others. So I think once you get the snowball effect going, you got to keep, keep it going. So you just got to figure out a way that person that's influential in your facility or a connection that you have. And all, again, we always talk about this. It comes down to connections, right? People you know. Do, can those people help you out 
and, and achieve your goal. And you just got to figure out that person that can help you. For me, it was Mike and Kevin and, and Dr. Fleissig and Dr. Andrews allowed me to speak to them. And then next thing I know, Kevin's like, oh, you want to do another one? And then next thing I know, I'm helping Kevin with talks around the U.S. And then I have my own course. So, it, um, you know, it's, it's somewhat luck, but it's also having connections to people that trust you once you prove yourself. You know, and true story too. We were we were um, we were waiting for Lenny to get rid of that Boston accent to see when he was Wicked. ready to, to go to that natural that that next stage here. And after like two three years, we're like, all right, we okay. might as well unleash him to the world. So, yeah, fun yeah. fun fact: Lenny and I were neighbors growing up. I don't know why we talk so differently, but uh, I I used to sound like Lenny. So, uh, what's up? Anybody else have anything? Did I see uh, another hand? Oh, Pope, what do you have, man? Uh, and I'm not crazy about speaking inter internationally and, and, you know, it's not really the main thing I want to push in my business. So take that with a grain of salt. But early on, I really wanted to. And the big thing that helped me out was just trying to speak as often as I can and trying to put myself out there for free for anyone that I think that I could be helpful with. Uh, for me, I'm in the niche of fitness and I knew a lot of CrossFit gym owners just because I was friendly and I loved working out with uh, those folks. So I just asked, Hey, would you guys want to do a, a seminar for free? And I would just put on about the same mobility or performance in the snatch or anything along those lines. And, uh, two things I think for one, like Lenny says, it builds your network, you know, and has other opportunities, but you start getting better at it. You get more comfortable. You figure what people like, what they dislike. And over the course of time, I think that really helped me to get onto a bigger stage from the beginning. Yeah. I would agree. Awesome. The last thing I was going to say is just, Try to make sure academically you have stuff that's like unique and interesting. I think, unfortunately, as more and more people are speaking, it's really easy to hear the same thing kind of over and over. So I found that things changed for me a little bit more in my ability to speak when it was like new information that people are like, oh, this is kind of like that gets word of mouth passed on more. Yeah. And I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a bonus answer to this, Abby, because this is my biggest pet peeve. Where you can tell when somebody's new at speaking like that. If you, get, you finally get to present somewhere, like maybe like a, a state chapter of your APTA or something like that, or maybe you get lucky, you get something like submitted to CSM or something like that. And you have a talk, like let's say me on like, like you know, rehabilitation following Tommy John surgery, right? Do not spend your first 25% of your talk talking about like the humorous in the ulna, right? Like, like going over the base, like stick to the, the, the strict thing that you are, you are instructed to, uh, to talk about. So, uh, awesome. Thanks, Abby. Who's next, Nick? Thanks, Abby. Uh, we got May Sheft is up next. May. May. Ka May. May. Kara, Kara May in the house. What's up? Hi guys. Belmont? Just, no. Uh, Bandy, Bandy, Bandy. Virginia, go Virginia. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> so I had said a baseball player for this, but for Dave, it can apply to any athlete. Um, have you ever had to manage an athlete on blood thinners during the season? And if so, how? Were you able to find a way to allow him or her to play in games? Ooh, good one. Personally, Anyone? I have this going on right now, so I actually <laughs> I, I have, but I'll see if anybody uh, else, no one, no. So yeah, maybe that's the athletic trainer in me, but like you come across those things a little bit. The, so the number one thing, I mean, obviously like as long as the physicians clear them to play, which I, I bet they would, right? It, mm. it, it has to be controlled. So yeah. the, the biggest thing we've always done is we just did uh, um, daily blood monitoring, uh, honestly, to just, to just make sure that the dosage of their medication was right. Because you know, especially at the pro level or collegiate level, they're like travel's really weird. Nutrition's really weird. Like you can get all out of whack, like pretty easy with something like that. So, um, so yeah, I mean, if you, if you are, uh, caring for somebody that is on blood thinners, the biggest thing is just to monitor and make sure that they're, they're testing it. If it's uncontrolled, then, then you're going to run into trouble. Makes okay. sense. Yeah. Sweet. Nick, who's next? I like it. Karame. Oh, we got Josh Paul Mentera. What's Hi. up, Josh? Not so much. How are you guys? Good. Uh, my question is like, after an athlete's like healed from like an ACL uh, torn, how would you uh, mentally like, like mentally like get them ready to get back onto the field? Wait, did wait, did, did you see? Did you say MCL or UCL? I I missed that. Uh, ACL. Oh, ACL. All right. So if if somebody's coming back from an ACL, did they actually like? Are they rehabbing it, or are, is this like you ran out on the field and their ACL was torn? Uh, they're kind of rehab. 
Got it. So, so you, all right. So let's see, we kind of, we talked about this in a podcast recently. Like, what do you guys do for like somebody like maybe that's dealing with like some maybe kinesiophobia or maybe some like fear? What, what's some of the biggest things we do? Len, why don't you start with this one? You're kind of our knee guy. I, um, I play mind games with them from day one after <laughs> surgery. So I am, uh, I am building mental confidence in them in um, everything I do. So if they have an awesome quad, like quad set, they are going to know about it. And it goes from there for the next nine plus months. So it's not like at the end, I'm like, all right, how do you feel? You're scared. All right, let's work on that. Uh, So I am building confidence the whole time, whether it's through a leg raise or that they went up in their uh, squat or they did something different and they felt good about it. I am building confidence the whole time and trying to get into their mindset to see how they felt about it, to see how they feel. There are questionnaires out there that you can give to people, the Tampa 11 scale or the ACL RSI. Um, I use those somewhat, uh, not as much as others do, I think, because I'm not really confident in my, in my clients to give me honest answers to them. So you can monitor that. I know uh, from three months, starting at three months out of surgery, a lot of PTs are using them and monitoring that uh that gain in confidence but to me i am just building confidence from day one and and it usually works with these people you're gonna you're gonna hit a lull and you're gonna tell people you know it's very normal right now to hit a lull but let's do something and let, make sure we put them in a position that they're gonna feel good that next time so they go back feeling good about it so not a straight answer but i think it's uh you know it's one one way that i do it i love <laughs> it what's who's next nick good question justin but that was justin right uh, uh, Josh. Josh. Josh, sorry, dude. Josh. My bad. You're fine. Uh, we got <laughs> Gabe Morgan is up next. Hold on a sec. Now we, I feel like we needed to. We, <laughs> yeah. we should have planned this. So the Gabeinator, sure. say hi, Gabe, so I can see you. Hey, on. what's up, man? What's up? I think yeah. There we go. I was gonna say you, what you have to start talking for it to pop up on my screen, but. So Gabe was obviously, you know, our first uh, student that was asking us questions on the podcast. So I think that means you're famous. I mean, that's, that's my take at least. But uh, we got to watch Gabe grow up in front of our eyes from just like a normal human being, uh, Gabe Morgan, right, to actually even changing his Twitter handle to the Gabinator. So he really <laughs> grew up in our eyes and everything. So Gabinator, what's going on, man? Welcome. It's good, man. Uh, congratulations on Twitter episodes. Uh, I kind of went in intermittently here and there. Um, sometimes the questions seem to repeat themselves every now and then. So, like, you know, I, I pick up when something new pops up. Uh, but, I mean, 200 episodes, that, that says a lot. That, that's awesome. So, uh, can you be honest, when, when you were there for that first episode, were you thinking in your head, there's no way this thing, this, this isn't going to work. <laughs> These clouds will never make it. <laughs> I, I mean, honestly, I was there to help you all out. So, I mean, if if I mean that helped y'all to get to 200, I mean that, that's <laughs> why I was there for. It, you know, it, it was. I think it was just me and you, right, Len? Yeah, yeah. I hadn't started working. Yeah. Yet. Yeah. <laughs> like, wow, we've grown. We've grown. That's pretty funny. So, <laughs> it, Gabe, what can we answer for you, buddy? All right, so uh, a little backstory here. I work with the uh, active duty army, and uh, most of the PTAs tend to do uh, our treatments. And uh, the hex bar deadlift is now a standard for their fitness test. So a lot of people are scared about performing a deadlift because there's a lot of fear attached like back pain and deadlift technique. Uh, so what, what is the easiest way to coach a hip hinge pattern for the low bar uh, hex bar deadlift for someone that doesn't have a coaching background? Wow. So th- th- that your uh, standard is even a, a low handle trap bar? Trap bar? Yeah. Wow. What, so that's interesting. Why go, why go trap iron? Low? Anyway, that's a whole nother story, but uh, I mean, yeah, that's, that's another uh, long talk there. If you're, uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, Pope, you want to take that one? What do you think? How do you, how do you get somebody started kind of coaching, uh, you know, the hinge that doesn't have a good coaching background? You got it. Are you saying the athlete has no experience hinging or the coach has no experience teaching athletes how to hinge? Oh, PTA, I'm guessing your case. <laughs> Both. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so a couple of really easy cues I think for helpful, or excuse me, are helpful for teaching a hip hinge or to try to stand close to a wall. So if you have a wall behind you and have athletes just reach their butt back towards the wall, that's a really easy cue to help them to hinge, right? Um, if you're noticing they're getting a whole lot of flexion in their lumbar spine while they're doing it, I ask them to reach their chin forward and their hips back. And usually that creates a nice hinge, 
right? Um, from there, you can get a little bit more elaborate and just say, okay, I need you to sink down a little deeper or bend your knees a little bit less. Uh, but those are probably the easiest cues that I teach uh, people to try to hinge. Uh, you can utilize a dowel, and that's probably the most classic one that people use for a hinge, where they put the dowel along someone's spine, and from there reach the hips back so people can have an idea of how to keep some contact um, with that dowel and keep a neutral spine. But oftentimes, I feel like you don't even need that. I skip that step almost every single time. Um, and then from there, arms are nice and long, get down a little deeper, grab onto the barbell. If things are not neutral at that point, reach the chest up a little bit more, hips back a little further, and usually that takes care of it. And I know that's super simple, but oftentimes it's, the hinge is uh, one of those movements that happens pretty naturally with a couple easy cues. But I think also in the social media world, you would think it's like you need to have two to three courses to learn how to master the hip hinge movement, you know? Yeah, and, mm -hmm. I, and I would just add to the, the fact that it's a hex bar. I think it's really easy if somebody's unfamiliar to turn it into a squat pattern uh, it, with a trap bar. So just, I think the big thing is just driving the hips backwards, right? So Dan gave a couple of good cues, like using external cues and using some external stimulus for that. But like, it's about driving the hips back. I think that's, I think that's the big key. So thanks, Gabe and Ader. Appreciate it. Appreciate one, it. one to 200. See that's you at 400, buddy. <laughs> that's impressive. He's yeah, asked questions on the first and 200th episode. Nick, who's next? All right, we got Vince Sahagin. Hopefully, I didn't uh, mess that last name up. What's up, Vince? What's up, guys? You nailed it. Dude, All right. nice. uh, you nailed it. <laughs> All right, so my question to you is, uh, for right now, I'm a first-year uh, SBT. Uh, nice and simple. If you could go back in time and give yourself any advice before your first inpatient clinical or job, what would you have told yourself? Thanks, uh, guys. I, oh, thank you so much. I, Vince. Vince. I'd start it off for me. That was like mid nineties. I'd probably say believe in Apple stock, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's gonna make a comeback. It's, it's, I think it's going to be, I think I, it's, they're going to hire Steve jobs back. Just trust me it. And, 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 and it'll all go. That's what I would say. But I don't know who wants to start this one. What do you think? Like, let, let's hear from a, a couple different. How about Mike and Lisa? Mike, why don't you start? What, what would you tell yeah. yourself now? All the, all the, the great wisdom you've learned. Uh, yeah, actually, I think looking back at my experience, my, my second clinical was an inpatient in a, an acute care in a big hospital setting. Uh, and I really, in my mind at that point, I kind of made up that I wanted to work with athletes. And I, I was pretty like hard set on doing that. Um, so what I did was my, my shift at the hospital was 7.30 a.m. to 3.30 p.m. And then from 4 p.m. until closing at this gym, I went and I shadowed at a gym. Um, and if you want to work with athletes, I think, you know, you can use that time during your clinical when you have some free time at the end or uh, beginning, find a gym that's close to the hospital and kind of shadow there. Um, I think you should definitely commit yourself and dedicate yourself to the inpatient clinical and learn as much as you can. Um, but if you really know that you want to work with athletes, like find a way to continue to work with athletes during that time and continue to grow towards your goal. I think that's great. Lisa, any other advice? What would you, what would you tell your student self? Yeah, so I, um, I actually had my clinical, my inpatient around the same time. It was my second clinical. Um, and I think, you know, I think there's a lot of value in learning that stage of rehab. Um, I think there's a lot of value in seeing like what people need to do in order to kind of come from, you know, sort of whatever bottom level they've reached to put them in an inpatient rehab setting. Um, and I think, you know, being able to learn from, you know, the, the experiences you have with those people to carry forward into your athletes in terms of, you know, the little bit at a time that those people have to do to like get better or, um, you know, the complicated backgrounds that they might have. But um, I think what I learned most out of that one was to be able to manage a lot of complicated things uh, within a patient's like you know chart um which i think you can carry that forward into any population you know any athlete that's had a lot of surgeries or any of the, anything like that yeah it makes it makes sense there's, i think there's a lot of carryover from inpatient too is like what if you do want to get the outpatient you got to see what it was like those first few days like the, the pain they were in like you know you get to probably read the op note a little bit easier than you would have if you're outpatient so so keep that in mind uh, one little tip that I did, I did my, my inpatient rotation was with Dr. Andrews. So it was all Tommy John's and ACL. So that was pretty cool. So, so if you can, if you can get in there or you can get into uh, Tim Heckman's place, 
I know he's got uh, all uh, knees uh, from, from Dr. Noyce. Uh, I know he's on the uh, call tonight. Uh, but uh, but uh, obviously, like, try to get into an inpatient place that maybe is a little more specific to you, too. That's another one. So, nice. Good answer, Vince. Good luck in school, man. Thank Who's you. Next? Who's next, Nick? Oh, we got Steve McKenzie is up next. What's up, Steve? Hey, guys. What's hey, going uh, on? Thanks for doing all this. And uh, my claim to fame is I work with Abby. <laughs> that's fantastic I'm, gl I'm glad you're not driving next to her i'm yeah. still worried about abby <laughs> right uh, all right so you guys talk a lot about uh strength training and loading and periodization with the quads after acl surgery reconstruction but how about hamstrings what's your favorite go-to hamstring exercise for loading for home exercise programs particularly in light of right now a lot of people can't get to gyms Nice. All right. Who wants to tackle this one? I feel like we can all answer this. Whoever raises their hand first. Let's see. <laughs> I <know. laughs> all right. So, so, so I'm going to pick Len though. So Len, Len we talk, we talk quad all the time after ECL, yeah. right? Talk, talk to me yeah. about hamstring. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's definitely a focus in my head. Quads are definitely the king after an ECL, but I'm hitting quads. I'm hitting hamstrings. I'm hitting glutes. So for me, in a perfect world, meaning we have jobs and we are working in a facility, I am deadlifting, I am doing Nordic hamstring curls, uh, which people can do at home. That's a great one to do, whether it's assisted with a band or if they can just somehow you know, have somebody hold their feet at home. Uh, I think a Nordic hamstring curl has been shown to be a great exercise for the hamstrings. Um, you can do ball rolls, so like a supine feet up on the ball, ball uh, rolling the ball. Uh, you can do um, supine feet up on furniture movers, like sliders, and slide their, the, extend their feet out, extend the knees out, and then bring their feet under. So I think there's a bunch of ways for me to uh, do stuff and be creative at home without needing a hex bar or some kind of conventional deadlift that we would typically do in a facility. So to nice. me, those are great hamstring exercises. Tilly, did you have something? Yeah, I'll just weigh in that. I learned this from Pope actually was doing, uh, instead of doing like single leg RDLs with your foot off the ground, like balance might be the limiting factor. I think like kickstand RDLs are phenomenal because you can load them up quite a bit more and not be limited by balance. So just like heavy backpack, bunch of books, just do a mid shin kickstand RDL. Yeah. And, and I just say like in baseball, we're starting to put a little bit more emphasis on hamstrings, even with our pitchers, because we're starting to see a lot of um, uh, baseball pitchers strain their, ha their hamstrings too, not just the position players. And we started testing, we started using things like the Nord board from Vald um, and, and actually trying to quantify all these things. And believe it or not, if you take a hamstring graph, so ACL or even Tommy John, you take a Gracilis graph, something like that, you have some pretty persistent strength deficits in there that that's got to mean something. That's got to mean something. So um, let's see, uh, Pope, what else you got? All right, real quick. I, I also think that uh, we can probably get the hamstring trained a little bit in a more functional manner by working on things like sprint drills. Uh, I love A, B, C, march, A, B, C, skip, A, B, C, runs. And this is dynamic. They don't have to be at a maximal level. And you're training the hamstring for what it's supposed to do functionally. And once you get to the point you're able to run, running is going to be a great way to train the hamstring as well. So um, I think sometimes we're thinking of all the exercises that are so important to target the hamstring. And obviously they are, but we have to prepare the hamstring for what it's actually supposed to do. So I think that spring can qualify for that. Love it. Great. Hope for the win. Hope for the win. Nice. Awesome. Good question, Steve. Great. Thanks, guys. Hey, Steve. What's up, Nick? Steve. Who's next for us? Oh, right, we got Michael Raddick. What's up, Michael? So hi, thank you for having us on here. This is awesome. Yeah, man. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Um, so my question is, uh, what advice would you have for people who are going to be in college and PT school for their many physical ther physical therapists? And what advice would you have for them to set themselves apart in the job field, kind of like how you did to work for the Red Sox? Yeah. So, I mean, I think the biggest thing you do is like, not everybody knows what they want to do while they're in college. And I had a lot of classmates that thought for sure they wanted to get in sports and ortho. And then they did like a pediatrics rotation and they loved it and they changed their career. Right. Um, so, you know, I'd say as a student, keep an open mind, but if you have something that you know is probably kind of your number one thing, the best thing you can do in PT school to set yourself up for future success is to get in at a good clinical site. 
right? So seek out people that are doing what you want to do uh, and learn from them and hopefully even integrate with them a little bit over time, right? So I always tell the story, that's kind of what I did like back like in the 90s before this interweb thing it was, was invented by, um, uh, by uh, all these smart people. We essentially uh, had to make phone calls. And I remember I just called up Dr. Glenn Fleissig with ASMI one day and like he answered like on the second ring and now that I know Glenn he doesn't do that much at work so I, it's actually not a weird story anymore but like but at the time he answered and and I, I I sought them out because they were the experts in the field I wanted to be in so I went to learn from them so I think that's the biggest thing for you for you right there to to try to get started Mike does that make sense okay yeah sweet awesome. Nick, thank who, you who's Nick next you're welcome Michael all right we got Jay Grimes What's up, Jay? Hey, Mike. Everybody, great to uh, great to be on the call. Thanks for thanks for doing this. Uh, yeah. A couple of, couple of quick questions I posted for you guys. It, it was baseball be, uh, baseball related. Nick, I know you're saying maybe let's go a little less baseball, but uh, <laughs> you know, just you know, I feel like we've we've beaten the shoulder range of motion restrictions and T spine range of motion uh, restrictions in these guys. Just wondering your thoughts on possible cervical spine involvement you know, restrictions in, in cervical extension or rotation that we're seeing with some of these starting pitchers. And then also your thoughts on like arm care programs and, and seeing this, this UCL injury prevalence, like still climbing despite what we've known and what we've tried to implement. You know, what are your thoughts on arm care programs and, and trying to keep these elbows healthy in these guys? It's, uh, it's loaded and, and obviously there's a lot of money at stake with these pro pitchers and even collegiate level. It's, it's, a, big, it's a big issue for us. Yeah, I, I'll start with the second one, and then and we'll see. Maybe uh, like Lenny, Mike, or somebody can 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 take over and talk about some of the other things, like kinetic chain based things. But for for the second half of your question, you know, about these injury rates still going up, you're right. Like so, you know, ASMI, the American Sports Medicine Institute, they have this injuries in baseball course every year, and it's I, I literally I've I've been going to it. I've been speaking at it. I think it's been like 21 years now that I've been going into a row. And I got up the other that when I was at the 20th, I got up and I was just like, you know what, this. Is my 20th year presenting here and injuries are getting worse so clearly none of this is working right we're wasting our time with these conferences but I think the big thing what's happening and I put this on an Instagram post uh, I think it was yesterday or the day before is that we are just overdosing right so in the past there were people were throwing with less velocity they were taking more time off they weren't showcasing they weren't doing as much so I think what's just right happening now is just we're simply overdosing if you look at all the studies at what correlates to injuries we've tried to blame everything Thing, right in the 80s we blame the sp split finger in the 90s we blame the curveball in the early 2000s we blame mechanics like inverted w's and stuff like that none of those things technically panned out they all increased stress but they didn't correlate to injuries workload correlated to injuries and i think everybody on this call would could relate to that so i think that's that's the reason why i mean so it's it's not magical it's not anything anybody's doing wrong it's, these kids are doing too much Right. And I don't know how much we can do that, but um, who wants to jump in and say like, you know, we see like cervical stuff like all the time in there. It's, it's, it's it, you know, the muscles connect. Right. But uh, so right. You, know, you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I would say uh, definitely starting to see it more often or maybe look for it more often. And, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily cervical facet joints that are irritated, but a lot of soft tissue in the neck and a lot of traction related nerve um, base pain and nerve based symptoms that may be like indicative of thoracic outlet syndrome or something like that. But people are kind of feeling it very proximally in the cerv uh, cervical spine or in the front of their neck. Um, so I've seen a lot of upper trap tightness, a lot of posterior scalenes, middle scalenes, um, kind of going into uh, subclavius and, and pec minor and stuff like that. Um, so we're seeing, I'm seeing a lot of people presenting with some soreness some tightness, or maybe even some numbness, tingling, loss of sensation in their hand. We start looking up towards the cervical spine, or we start looking more towards like a thoracic outlet-based syndrome. Sweet. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. Good question. What do we got, Nick? All right, we got Tony Mitchell is next. <laughs> that was very formal, Nick. Uh, nailed that one. <laughs> <laughs> Get into a dry now. <laughs> What's up, Tony? How are you guys doing today? Good. Yeah. How are you? Doing good. All right, so um, I have two questions. I don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask two questions. Is that all right? Well, it'll, it'll depend. Ask them first, and I may, I may ignore okay. one. That's fine. All right, that's fine. Um, okay, first. Uh-oh. 
Uh-oh. May not be able to get any of <laughs> All right, Nick. Nick, who, next. Who, who, who's next? And then maybe we can get Tony to reconnect. Who's, uh, who's next on our list? We got um, JP Mercia is next. Sorry, Tony. Connect, reconnect, though. And, you know, on, begin on, a career. And, reconnect, uh, sort of. reconnect on 4G. That'd be awesome. All right, who's next, Nick? <laughs> I got JP Mercia. What's up, JP? Hey, what's going on, guys? Um, so I'm from San Diego, California, and I just want to say, first of all, congrats on 200 episodes. And thanks for putting this on. This is legendary. So, awesome. um, thanks, man. So my question is pretty general. Uh, I'm a PT student right now, but um, how do you guys go about restoring range of motion? Uh, do you guys utilize like static stretching, dynamic stretching, PNF, or something else? Just because like our new understandings regarding the mechanisms behind stretching have me confused on how to program or like dose stretching um, in our patients. So. Oh, I love it. That's a good one. Who wants to start that one? Who wants to take that one? That's a good question. Yeah, I can dig this one. I deal with a lot of people like that's their main goal is just get like hyper mobility back or full range of motion stretching. And um, the biggest thing is you have to understand like the basic science and then take that with a grain of salt and actually apply things, right? I think people are stuck too much in the why it works, does it work? And people like, if you listen to social media, nobody would do anything ever. Like we would just stand there and look at people, right? Wouldn't get anything done. So understand the mechanisms, but then use a little bit of everything that's effective from the research we know. And so Dan and I often talk to people uh, in large group settings and we say like, use a little bit of everything that you think kind of works from the research and has good support. And then maybe put it in a circuit versus just doing one thing for like 10 minutes, right? So maybe a little bit of soft tissue work real quick. Maybe a little bit of um, static stretching has some decent support behind it for um, a big systematic review that came out. Eccentrics are really good as well. And then I think people miss strength conditioning and just good exercise programming, right? Those five things all have pretty decent support behind it for, you know, long-term mobility gains. So consistency over intensity is probably the most important thing. And I would just kind of sprinkle in a little bit for everybody. Yeah. And there, just realize that a loss of motion can have several different mechanisms, right? You could have capsular tightness. You could have soft tissue tightness. You could have a length issue. You could just have a tone issue. You could have a spasticity or a guarding issue that, that needs more neuromodulation. So I think the key to, to really doing it instead of just trying a little bit of everything is trying to figure out exactly which one of those, those um, uh, is the culprit, I guess, is the one. So, uh, but good question. Good luck in school, JP. Enjoy the weather down there. I'm Thank jealous. You. <laughs> All right, Nick. Oh, we got Katul Shah is next. What's up, Katul? Oh, what's, what's up? up? Yeah. What's up, brother? Um, so I have a couple of distal biceps tears in the clinic right now. And I saw another therapist do a supine bicep hang. And that kind of made me think about uh, what we learned about the ACL with pro and hamstring hang. So I was kind of wondering if there's if it's just as dangerous to do a supine bicep hang as it is uh, with like, pro and hamstring hangs with ACLs. That's interesting. So distal bicep and they just have them hanging, just holding with gravity. Yeah. Just trying to get that extension. And I've reversed it. So I have them prone with relative supination and I push down like I would do with the knee. Right. I was kind of, you know, I was kind of wondering if there's like any core, you know, any relation to that or if I was on yeah. the right track of thinking. I, you know, that, that's pretty neat. You know, like, uh, you know, Lenny and I've talked about the guy quite a bit. I think we both have posts on our websites that kind of talk about, you know, the, the position of, of a knee hang, right? The reason why we don't like a prone knee hang, right, for, for knee extension is because it's, it's often uncomfortable and you get some guarding in there. So I, I, I would say to answer your question, I think like whatever position allows them to relax so they can be in that position, I, I, I think that's the one you want to go for. So if it's prone, supine, whichever way you have in there, whatever allows them to relax and not guard against the motion, right? So in terms of like the safety, you kind of talked about the safety of it there. I think it just depends on what week you're at, like the healing tissue type thing. Should, be, should you be just doing some gentle, like you can progress from just like the body weight to then actually adding some overpressure and maybe even some low load long duration. So I would say it's, it's, uh, it, it's safe if you're doing it with the right load at the right time and just pick the position that allows the person to relax and not guard against it. Sound good? Cool. Awesome. I was going to pitch that to somebody else, but I, I, think that, I think that nailed it. So, Nick, who's next? Thanks, Katul. We got Bryce Anderson is next. What's up, Bryce? Hey, how we doing? Yo. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, um, I've had a lot of ankle injuries uh, during football, and I was wondering what are ways to improve ankle mobility and ankle strength? Nice. I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw this to Tilly again because 
we talked about ankle sprains and the first thing he said is ankle mobility is what he wanted to work on. So Dave works with a lot of hypermobile people that think they need mobility, but maybe yeah. they don't. What do you think, Dave? What would you recommend that, that um, we do here with Bryce? Yeah, I would say the other layer to this too is a lot of like gymnasts that I work with just uh, destroy their ankles from landing really heavy. So it kind of leads to the important part of the question, which is a, a, a lot of reasons why you can have limited ankle mobility. So, you know, I've had some gymnasts that come to me and like, oh, I'm stretching every day. I'm doing everything I can. And they have a massive osteophyte in the Taller Dome because they've just like beaten their ankle up. So that's one possibility. I'm not saying that you have that, but that's like the joint itself could be a big problem, right? So if there's an issue with the joint, that's a different problem you got to outsource. But then past mm -hmm. that, if it's an actual rehab problem, there's the joint itself could be stiff and then the calf muscle or the soleus could be limiting. So you kind of got to okay. do some assessments there to figure out, you know, if someone does some glides on your ankle and it's like, oh, it's a, it's a stiffness in the joint, you might have to do some more like, you know, distractions and some joint mobilizations versus if somebody says like, no, that looks pretty good, but like, you know, your calf is just super, super stiff. And you might have to work more on the soft tissue stuff, which is kind of what we talked about before, which is some soft tissue work manually, some eccentrics off a, a step are real good as long as you're feeling it in the back and not in the front of the joint. So I think the screening process is really important to know kind of what, avenue to go down first if that makes sense i love it okay D dave do you, need to, do you need to change the battery in your uh, smoke detector is that what's uh, <laughs> is that me <laughs> no i don't know you were, you were the one talking i just assumed the microphone was picking you up oh no i don't i don't <laughs> uh all right nick who's next uh we're gonna go with jeremiah mensa you're up next what's up jeremiah Ooh, i'm gonna unmute you i got him okay can you hear me now i got you yeah, yeah. what's up man Okay, so I have a question. So I'm an athlete and I have kind of like bad hips. And so I'm wondering like, what type of advice would you do? What would you give me for helping on my hip flexibility and mobility? Wait, what, what sports do you play, Jeremiah? Uh, I'm a football player at Wittenberg. Nice, awesome. What, uh, what position do you play? Uh, offensive guard. Got it, all right. So you're a big dude. Yes, sir. Nice, that's what I'm <laughs> talking about. Good. All right, so, so Pope, what do you think? He's, we got a big offensive lineman. Right, that uh, you know, are you having some hip pain? You having some hip issues right now, Jeremiah? Yes, sir. Yeah, so we get we get a bunch of it, uh, you know, things going on. So what do you, what do you, what do you think, Dan? What 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 do you recommend? I mean, I know that's kind of broad without being able to see you, but like, what's some of the things you see in some of your athletes, especially some of the big athletes in contact sports? Yeah, well, I think there's a couple things. So for one, some of the tightness that you're kind of feeling within the hip, I think a lot of that's probably related to pain and the tightness is not necessarily the muscle. I'm guessing, I don't know, we haven't evaluated yet, but I'm guessing a lot of that tightness is really just the hip being cranky and irritated from playing your sports, you know? Um, so yeah, you can work on some mobility, but I honestly, for folks that have irritated hips like yourself, I don't push the mobility that much. I would rather have a program that's going to strengthen all the musculature around the hip to make it stronger, more stable, right? And back off of the movements that bug it for a little bit. Um, honestly, it depends on what your training is looking like. I'm guessing you're not doing a ton of it right now. Um, and then what your goals are when your important seasons are, but, um, that would be the way I was started anyway. Yeah. And I, I would say, I would just add in there for you, Jeremiah, that, Oftentimes when athletes come to me with hip pain like that, one of the first things I'll focus on is probably soft tissue mobility and less like, like actual hip mobility. Cause oftentimes, like Dan said, the joint gets cranky. We start pinching we start irritating a little bit more. It's kind of more of the soft tissue for that. So, um, you know, without seeing you, I think that's, that's, you know, I think that's a good focus though. Like a lot of people come to us and they'll come to champion like yourself and they'll, they'll say like, yeah, well, now I've been working on my hip mobility for forever. But you know, every time I, I bring my knee up to my chest, I get this pinch. We're like, so we say like, well, you should stop that. And then we're, we're immediately smart people. Right. So like it, it's it, oftentimes it's less is more, if that makes sense. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So awesome. Much. Good luck. You guys can be any good next year. Yes, sir. That's what I'm talking about. I like that comment. <laughs> like that, what, like that. What, do you, what do you think about Gronk going to Tampa right now? Is that crazy? Yeah, that's ridiculous. Like, <laughs> <laughs> We're all up in Boston. In, in Belichick, we still believe. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, All right, who, who's next, Nick? Uh, we got Nicole Madrid. What's up, Nicole? Hi, guys. Um, thanks Nicole. for doing this. Wait, hold on. Hold on one second, Nicole. Try that again. We missed it a little bit. It cut out. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. I was just saying that I work with Marcus Cantu, and he's been telling me so much about you guys, so it's cool to jump on here with you all. Nice. Um, I have a couple of questions. I was curious, um, what's your return to play criteria um, for after post-ACL repair? 
And also, um, how long do you recommend they wear the ACL brace when returning back to their sport? Those are good questions. I like you. The Lenny Twitter rant. I know. Ready? <laughs> and everybody, we're all going to get down. Everybody duck, everybody duck off screen. <laughs> Lenny rant coming in three, two, one. And, and Len, I just, I don't know if you've been looking around, but let's just say, with you know, like Tim Hewitt's not on this call, but there's a lot of smart knee people on this call that might uh, argue back with you. So be careful. Right. I know. <laughs> Um, uh, well, but we'll, we'll do our best. We'll, we'll be politically correct. Uh, um, I think the research is still not there yet. Right. Like, so we say like pop tests and we say, um, you know, biodex tests, isokinetic tests, we say all these different tests. Um, we don't know. Right. So that's why I think our retail rates are so high. Uh, there's many different reasons, like insur insurance issues, um, quad weakness persists. So what about tests that we do for me? Um, I like to get some kind of quad strength index. So for me, it's an isometric test using a handheld dynamometer, but I'm not using my hand, so to speak. I have them kick into it in the hand. It's uh, they're pushing basically into the table because I don't want to have to stabilize. So I use that. And then I am just watching them for nine months. Honestly, I, I take a very rogue approach, if, so to speak. If you look at compared to social media, um, I, I like if you have an isokinetic test, I think that would be a great way to get some quad and hamstring strength. Um, I recently spoke to speaking to Tim Hewitt, Tim Hewitt on his Facebook page, and he's uh, still a proponent of pop tests. And I said, I'm surprised Tim, and I don't want to speak for him. It's on Facebook, but he did say that it's kind of a legacy thing for him because he was in Cincinnati with Frank Noyes when they developed that. So he still has a love for the hop test. I don't use hop tests. Um, I think I've used it once in my career. So, um, so I, I try to get a quad index somehow, whether it's isokinetic or isometric. And I watch my athletes throughout the whole process and I am digging into their minds as much as I can. Honestly, I literally, like I said earlier, I'm playing mind games with my people to figure out how they're feeling. And so they can't pull a fast one on me, but um, otherwise maybe like a depth jump, some kind of depth jump and, and looking at the, and assessing their mode of how, how well they can jump and land. Um, Slow-mo video is a great way to look at that, that as well. But otherwise um, the research is not screaming. Anything is adequate right now, unfortunately. Yeah, and I would just say, like, Lenny's not saying don't do anything. I think what, he's, he, what he's saying is that, um, you know, be, do a thorough assessment here, but just realize it's okay if, you're, it, it, if you don't do everything, if you don't have, you know, access to an isokinetic or you don't do everything, right? It's nothing's been proven to be perfect, so you're not missing out on the boat. I think the biggest thing by doing all these tests is you're just going to look at the person. You're going to see him do a few of these movements, and you're just going to say they're not ready. You know what I mean? Like, cause we, we have this talk a lot with return to play. We get together in some of these like big groups, like with some of our, our colleagues, we have this like ICA society where we talk and, and we get together and it's, it's, it's funny, but you ask like the Kevin Wilkes of the world, the Bob Mangines, like the Russ Paynes, like the Mike Voigt's, like all these guys, you ask them, they're not struggling to get their athletes back. They're not struggling with quad weakness. They're not struggling with that. Now, maybe that is just a uh, patient selection, right? That they're just getting higher level people. People, but just like keep that in mind it's it's you know it's 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 just a it's just something to think about when you're going through that so um and just quickly on the brace len um oh, the know, brace yeah My, you know the brace uh, i like i like braces braces don't have to be for all uh i leave i leave it up to the athlete i'd probably say the first season back probably wear the brace um and see how they mentally feel with it um maybe a year at the most i think but i think that first season back if they feel like they need it then i'm all for it but if i get a really good sense that they don't need it and they think it's going to hinder them and their position and then their speed and all that. Then, and I just got to make sure that they are super strong to be able to handle the forces and they better be, but the brace is kind of more of a mental kind of crutch uh, than anything else really. Unless you're like Jeremiah and your alignment, then you're probably going to wear the, the brace for a long time. Right. But, <laughs> but awesome. Right. Good, good, good questions. Who's, who's next, you. Nick? Tony okay. Mitchell America's is select. back. <laughs> oh good back. Back. let's see what we got him. yes tony it's gonna be better what's up man how you guys doing here i am yeah that's good man what's going on what, what can we do all right so like i was saying um so i know um there's a lot of certifications out there for um people trying to become strength conditioning coaches or personal trainers and uh, i just wanted to hear um what do you think some of those um Certifications do you recommend for those trying to like start the career in those kind of fields? 
Yeah, great, great question. I, I, I'm going to say for this one, for, for the, the certification that you think is best for you, it's, it's going to be the one that you jive with their educational curriculum the best, right? So I'd say the three big ones, and I don't, I don't want to leave anybody out, but it's uh, NSCA, obviously, NASM and probably ACE are probably like the three big ones in there. Like ACE to me is a lot like more just like, like personal training. Uh, NSCA is probably like the most like scientific, like physiology based, like most hardcore. And then NASM in the middle is kind of more like that practical, like, like corrective exercise specialist, like sort of thing. Now there's a lot of blur in between those. So that may not be like a perfect answer, but I would look at each of their curriculums because the answer is it doesn't matter right? Like you can probably get all the same jobs with any of those certifications. You could probably still get licensed in your state if you need to. You don't even need to be licensed in your state in, in, in Massachusetts, right? Like my mother can be a personal trainer tomorrow if she decides to. She just needs to make a business card, right? So it, it, just, it just depends. So I would say don't pick it because you're trying to impress somebody. Pick it because you like their educational curriculum a little bit. And that's, that's kind of how I would go for that. Cool. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, Dan, did you have anything to add to that? I'd say it depends on where you want to work. Figure out where you want to work, figure out what the requirements are and get what they, you know, need and then find right. a place that you can kind of shadow a mentor to learn the good stuff because that's when it really that's where it really occurs. It doesn't really happen with the certifications as much. I, I, I think, think also boils, right? Two boils a uh, certified functional strength coach would probably be another option too, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that's going to lead to any like you a license, you know, thing though. I think that's the only difference though with, with the different ones. I, I I took it more as as that was the question. I I think the only the only one that has like something where like like some professions required is probably the NSCA one. So again, if you're trying to go collegiate or pro, I mean, oftentimes they they require like it like in professional baseball, you need to have a CSCS if you want to work in pro baseball. So keep that in mind too. All right, Tony. Yep, I appreciate it. All right, good luck, man. Who's next, Nick? All right, we got Chuck Rowland is next. What's up, Chuck? Up, Chuck. Chuck. Oh yeah, I didn't even I didn't even notice. How you doing? <laughs> good. How's it going? Good. Can you What's hear me? going on? Yeah, there you go. I see you. Yeah, you right. popped on the screen. What's going on, Chuck? Great. Uh, congratulations on two hundred. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I work with a D one university fencing team. The strength and conditioning department doesn't even know I exist. Uh, the head coach brought me. The head coach brought me in after I demonstrated a particular type of resistance stretching. Um, for the past two seasons, I've taught the team resistance stretching, and I've actually stretched the starters. Um, this fall, we're going to have 48 fencers on the team. Um, I was wondering, how do you think I should go about introducing CPS? And getting them going with the champion performance uh, movement spe uh, assessment that you're talking about there. I, 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 well, you know what I like what you've done so far, Chuck, is you've, you've, you got integrated in with the team. Right. So you have some buy in you, you the coach is supporting you. That's going to be super helpful for anybody that's trying to go in with them there. So you have a particular style of, of training that has been effective for you. And I, I respect that because there's so many ways to skin a cat. So I love that. So you have that right there. What, what a, anything, any type of movement assessment and any type of pre-season screening can do, whether it be ours, our, our champion performance specialist one, or anyone's FMS, anything. Uh, what it can do is it can run people through a screen in a relatively quick fashion and help you identify areas to try to optimize them a little bit more. Right. So instead of everybody on the team getting the same program, what you can do is you can start like and maybe it's not even like everybody's getting a specific program, but maybe you can have some buckets like, oh, for everybody that can't hinge for everybody that has a terrible overhead reach. Right. Those are big things that are probably important in fencing. They're going to get these two specific drills and this loading exercise, for example, right? And then you bucket the team. So what, what's, what any type of movement assessment will do for you is to help them screen so you can start individualizing them. And man, that's going to be super powerful for you, for, for, for you, Chuck. And it's just going to take one season and then everybody's going to see it too and they're going to love it and they're going to be super, super grateful for you, man. That's what I hope. <laughs> awesome. Good luck, Chuck. Man. Thanks for Thank the question, you. man. Good luck, Chuck. All right, we got John Harris is up next. 
Hey, John. John, how's it going? Nope. Good. Um, so my question was, uh, with the way kind of the world and really the fitness industry and all that um, is kind of moving more online now, um, how do you personally like scale and grow in that sense? And then uh, how do you also maintain that human connection um, when you're not in person? I, I think you got the, the million dollar question right now, which that everybody's trying to figure this out. Um, I, I, my emotions as a fitness business owner, right? Like my emotions have gone all over the place through this process. Um, luckily for us, like champion, we have an online training platform that we had prior. So, um, that obviously helps that we weren't like scuffling to get through really fast to, to start something, but I'll be honest with you. It's not going to replace in-person connections. And at first I was, I was thinking this is going to be devastating. Then I went through this period where I was like, oh, people are going to be afraid to come back. I think that the, my current emotion, and I'll probably change this tomorrow when Lenny slacks me new statistics like he does every day lately and, and it gets <laughs> depressing. But, uh, but I, I, think, I, I think my current feeling is that people are going to sprint back into the gym right now. Because I think people are missing the connection. People are missing the bond that they have, not only with the coaches and personal trainers, but also the other clients that they get to see. This becomes their community in their lives. So I, what I would say is, you know, I was just listening to my buddy Pat Rigsby's podcast. He's a, like a great fitness business guy. Uh, and what he just said right here is, I think this just brings out the fact that even if you end up going online or hybrid model or something like that, it's not about just like, you know, selling templates and getting people workouts. People aren't buying an exercise. You can get that stuff for free on the internet. They're buying the connection. So you got to figure out a way to, to create a community, even if it's online and to be able to communicate with them, like, and be there for them. That's what people want, right? Like we all know how to exercise. None of us still want to do it. Right. I know Dewey's on here somewhere. It's like, someone's going to get mad at me for that. Right. Like nobody wants to work out. Right. So like, it's not that we don't, it's like, you need that kick in the butt and that accountability. I think uh, it will, will, will be very helpful. Right. That makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Good luck. Who's next, Nick? We got Vince Bordeval. What's up, Vince? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, what's up, Vince? Hi, I'm from Quebec City. Uh, so I'm a physiotherapist here. And all I see here is uh, private clinics. Uh, they have little gyms or maybe no gyms uh, available, okay? Uh, mine has maybe a little gym. And I just noticed that you guys at Champions kind of have uh, this big gym around, which is really cool. I really like it. So I was wondering if uh, that's, that is a something that is kind of a, a standard or one of a kind uh, in the U.S. or uh, in the state you're in. And uh, that's something that we'll love to have here in Quebec. Yeah, no, I, 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 that, that's a great question. And, and I mean, I, I can answer that a little bit here, too. I'd say I don't know if it's the standard. I think uh, it's becoming more common. Uh, but it certainly wasn't the standard. But when we started Champion, uh, one of the key things, we had like a few like, I think like differentiations that, that we wanted to really make sure we, we, we stuck to. But one of them was, was this. And if you've ever like been an employee in a PT clinic, you're going to know what I mean when I say this. But we built a gym and added physical therapy to it not the other way around. So oftentimes what you have is like you're renting office space on the fourth floor in a building with drop ceilings and curtains around treatment tables and stuff like that. And you're like, I got an idea. Let's start fitness. Let's put a squat rack in here. Right. That's going to be cool. Right. And like nobody wants to work out in that environment. Right. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to provide a full service for people where they could do every aspect of that. So we thought like, well, if we're just going to put a squat rack in, a, in an office building, that's not going to be what we want. So we did the exact opposite. If you make a gym and then add PT to it, and I know maybe that's just like, like semantics, and I think it makes all the difference in the atmosphere and the vibe in the place, and, and I think that's what works. That makes sense? Yeah, that does make uh, sense of that. So like you would have uh, those things on the same floor, so the gym and uh, the PT place or 
You could. I mean, like, you know, it was funny. Like, I think, well, you know, Lenny and I were designing Champion at the beginning and we kind of, um, we had the, t- the treatment tables out in the open. Like, cause we've always been in, out in the open and we had the treatment tables out in the open, like as part of the gym. And then we just stumbled into our, our current space and it happens to be in a private room, but there's all windows. So you don't feel like you're in a bubble, even though we are, we think the gym's the bubble, right? Cause we're in the PT room. We think they're in the bubble and they're mm. definitely looking at us like we're in the bubble yeah. the whole time. I see our coaches smiling when I say that, but, um, but yeah, I, I actually like having the separation, but being together. So I don't know if I'd like it on two different floors, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think awesome. I, I like on the same floor. That's a uh, yeah. I mean, we're, we're out there. Ha- we're out there half the time, right? All yeah. the time we're out in the gym half the time working on people. So, thanks, Vincent. Uh, who's up, Nick? All right, we got Sierra Hackinson is next. Yeah. What's the up, Sierra? What's, What's up, going Sierra? on? How's it going? The ultimate throwback episodes. How was uh, <laughs> how was spring training, Sierra? Did you get like any days in? I was there for about ten days. Nice. Okay, that's awesome. So Sierra I was one- to stay for the quarantine, and they're like nobody's staying. So yeah, yeah. So Sierra was one of our strength and conditioning interns last year, and she's uh, also an athletic trainer. So she uh, she got a job with the Padres this winter. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you got to work in pro baseball for 10 days. Congratulations. Hey. <laughs> um, I'll go back next summer or whenever <laughs> it decides to happen. Uh, my question was kind of baseball related, but I'm going to make it more general because I'm curious what you guys have to say. Uh, but working with an athlete who's returning from an Achilles tendon repair, um, it, current situation is a uh, right-handed pitcher left Achilles tendon repair about five months. Um, but in general, uh, especially with like athletes where it's a little more dynamic, like gymnastics, um, what is your guys' really specific return to full play criteria? What are some of the risks you're thinking about when you're trying to make that decision? Nice. All right. Who wants to take that? Yeah. I mean, I have two right now, so I can kind of weigh in. I have, I think maybe somebody else has two, but yeah, it's, it's tough because Dan and I had a long conversation about this, like the return from two different surgeons, really high respected doctors in Boston. Like you get to five months and like, all right, good luck. Five functional activities. And you're like, uh, all right, that's kind of a big aggressive jump we're taking here. So I think you look at the literature, they want to say like, you know, single leg calf raise test is obviously probably what people are most going for. So calf endurance, stuff like that. I think that's pretty well respected. And then we have some single leg jumping assessments, but I don't think that's enough. I think that's when it becomes more about working with strength coaches and being like, what's the natural progression. If you had this person in front of you, what would you do to help them get more fit in general? So I learned a lot from Dan and from the strength coaches we have, but like a lot of, they should be able to tolerate like pretty good double leg bounding first, you know, in multiple planes of direction. And then you should be able to work up to single leg jump and sticks with no amortization phase. And then the are the stuff they should be able to do is run and, and have a quick turnover time and have repeated jumps. So that should probably happen over like two months, but that's all these athletes I'm working with now went from like six to nine months. And it was kind of just like a wild west a little bit. We we're just going based on strength conditioning principles. Yeah. You, you just get, you get to build up workload slow with those ones here. That's, that's a tough one, right? I, I just keep this in mind too, that Achilles tendon is that thick for a reason, right? There's, there's so much stress that goes through it. So you have, you get, you get to build up your workloads with that one. So, um, you know, but I, I feel like every time I've had an Achilles, I've felt probably just like you, right. Where you're a little uncertain, especially like kind of like younger in your career, um, and you know, they end up doing well, but i trust me, I, I, you know, even doing this for over 20 years now, like I, you, they're coming back and running that first time. And you're kind of like, oh. kind of like, <laughs> you know, like holding your breath a little bit. Like, yeah. I don't know, maybe it's cause Achilles rupture is like my worst, then my worst fear personally. But, um, first know. hurdle session, you're like, everybody just brace for <laughs> <him. laughs> it. Yeah. I'm, I'm not even doing hurdles. I'm out. Uh, but awesome. Th- thanks, Sierra. Thanks Sierra. guys. All right, we got uh, Seth is up next. Hey, Seth. Can you hear me? Yeah, Yeah. what's up, man? All right, so this question is coming from an athlete with a history of ankle injury. Um, Do you have any advice to strengthen the ankle to prevent future injuries for someone with loose ligaments? Ah, good question. Who wants to tackle that one? Who haven't we heard from? I can start it off if you want. Yeah, let's hear it, Mike. So I would say if you look at uh, if you look at ankle sprains, particularly inversion ankle sprains, and the ATFL is, is commonly impl- implicated in those type of injuries, we know that there's a decrease in proprioception, so our joint awareness and space. Um, so that is definitely key to restore that. That can influence our balance. That can influence power, uh, jumping ability, and stuff like that, and landing ability. So it's definitely important to address that. I think one of the easiest ways is start with baseline strengthening using a TheraBand. We've all done like four-way ankle type stuff. Uh, And then progressing a balance 
uh, program where we're adding different challenges to their single leg balance activity. Maybe we put them on an AirX pad. Uh, we do stuff like that. From a proprioceptive standpoint, we're probably getting good input uh, into the system and learning how to kind of um, balance again, I guess. Yeah, and it's, it's probably more so, it's more than just strength, I think, is, 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 is the answer, Seth, for you. It's, it's, it's about the, the coordination of it, the neuromuscular control of it. That's why a lot of people feel unstable over time. Uh, you can have decent strength, right? Um, it's, it's not hard to get the ankle strong, but to have that balance and coordination is often why people feel weird afterwards. Um, but, yeah, good luck, Seth. Yep, thank Thanks, you. Seth. Yeah, you got it, man. What's up, Nick? We got Antonio Monteroso. Oh, I thought you were going to say Brown. I was going to say, is he going to Tampa too? Oh, <laughs> Just say Ben Darris. <laughs> What's up, Antonio? Uh oh. Come on, Nick. Sitting out just kidding. <laughs> I got, can, can, we, can, we take, can we take a moment right here to give Nick Esposito a round of hey, applause here? Hey. I mean, I, what the a great. And twos. What a, great, what a great MC. I mean, you are doing a really good job, but <laughs> thank you. He's got to be sweating over there right now, though. <laughs> <laughs> Got some spotlights behind me, you know? <laughs> All right, who's next, Nick? <laughs> uh, we are literally almost out of questions. Oh, that's fantastic. I like it. All right, so let's do last call. If you get some more questions, that's good. We got a few more minutes. I like it. This is, this is exactly why we're here. You guys have brought a bunch of amazing questions for us. So maybe we'll take, maybe take one more. If we can get one more in, who wants to be the last one? Uh, now I'm scrolling through. I'm looking at faces right here. I see some good people. <laughs> What's up, Megan? Megan, you look so studious with your glasses on. I don't know if I've ever seen your glasses on. I like it. That's awesome. You see some more people driving. I'm still, I'm worried about you people. Don't be driving like Abby was. It's people at the beach, man. Steve's at the beach right now. I like it. There's some good beaches. That's, yeah, right? That's perfect. I saw, I, I saw a lot of familiar names on here. And really, there's – I'm not kidding. I, I, I've recognized some names on here, like Jeff Lemon and stuff like that. Like, I, 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 Jeff's been, like, like, commenting on stuff of mine for, for 10 years now, right? So, you know, thanks, Jeff, and, and all you guys. I'm, I'm just seeing a lot of familiar faces, right? Like from, oh, we got a rowing like, question. we got to get that one been interacting so you know so thank you everybody for that so all right let's do it last one make it a good one nick Actually, you want let's get the rowing one in I yeah think be a good rowing ribbon let's <laughs> go sorry christina please, please. Um, please. Um, please. Um, please. all right let me uh now. let me unmute them so patrick schober is up next what's up patrick hey guys can you hear me yes yes, yes. all right uh, my picture is not coming up on my screen um so i rode at syracuse university in undergrad and we had a fair amount of rib injuries while I was there. Um, I never had one on my own, but uh, I was wondering when you guys would kind of see them, how you would progress them back, or uh, if you had like return to sport criteria when they could go back. For us, it was basically training room, fighting with our coach to kind of have them sit out longer than they really could, depending on what time the season it was. So I know Lisa has a wrong background. Did Lisa put him in the crowd? Lisa planted it. <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't. I, I also noticed his name was Pat. I was like, hmm. That's Pat on a, no. on a mic in the bathroom. <laughs> that's that's uh, Lisa's significant other is also Pat. But. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Pat, funny story is I actually found Lenny because I broke my ribs. So, it's that nice little <laughs> <laughs> connection. Okay. Lenny of the course. That's Lisa has <laughs> lived this. <laughs> um so i'm just reading your question again just to make sure i get all the pieces but i mean rib injuries and in rowing are not quite actually as common as rowers might think they are um they happen because of overtraining essentially and like increasing your training volume too quickly um generally they're more common in females than males um but it's really like the return to sport piece of it is really symptom based. Like everyone heals at different rates. Like um, I've had teammates who took longer than I did. And I've um, probably worked through some that I shouldn't have. Like it, it really just depends on the severity of it and um, how well the person takes care of themselves to recover from it. I, yeah, I don't know. It's it's a it's a scary. It's like the scariest injury in rowing because it's really it puts you out really bad. Like your only option for cardio is like biking, and you can't even breathe that hard. Like 
um, so it is, it's a, it's a scary one. And the fact that your team had a lot of them means your training plan essentially wasn't, wasn't the best. You know, but, and that, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I think of injuries like that all the time. It's like, it's, a, you know, a rib fracture is not, you know, a stress reaction like that. that it's not an acute injury in somebody like a rower. It comes down to your workload, right? So you get, you got to figure yeah. out why, you know, what, why your workload puts so much stress on you there. So, um, so I don't know. So I don't know the, the crowd may get, get, get mad at me here, but we still have well over a hundred people online. And it was funny when we put the call in for last call, what did we just get like 10 more questions there? <laughs> that was yeah, awesome. Quite so, a few. I mean, who still wants to do it? Get it. The game so says whiskey, to do it. I'll be right back. Let's go. <laughs> All right. Let's, 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 let's keep going, Nick. Let's keep going. All right, let's go Frank Alexander. You're up next. Hey, on, what's up, yeah, Frank? What's going on, Mike? What's going on, guys? Hey, good to hear from you, Frank. How you been? Not too bad. Not right too bad. My, my question is, and we're all in the same boat, busy practices, families, all the, other, all the other fun stuff that goes into it. How do you devour the amount of research that's out there in an efficient way? Now, that's a great question, and, and, and it's, a, it's an important one, too, because – there are so many journals now, right? Like it's, uh, I'm getting overwhelmed with the amount of journals that are coming out and how, and how many articles are being published. And I'll be honest, like, so, you know, Frank and I, we, we work with a lot of baseball players. Like, so like we get these things, I'm telling you the baseball research, I would say I read the, I go right to the methods and I say 75% of the articles, I don't get past the methods. I just say, this isn't a valid study. Um, so, you know, we, we see that quite a bit with that. It's like, it's like the barrier of entry to be, to be published nowadays is a lot lower than it used to be. And peer review is going downhill. You have these open access journals where you can submit an article and it can get published in a week if you pay them 1500 bucks. Uh, it's crazy right now. So, so I, so my biggest tip, especially for some of the young crowd that comes into this, right. And they're like, where do I get started is just pick like start with like four reputable journals that you want to follow consistently. So uh, I, I'd love to get some other thoughts. So I'm going to say for the PT crowd, JOSPT, although I'll be honest with you, <laughs> it's been a while since I've gotten a good article out of JOSPT. I remember like about 20 years ago when physical therapy, the journal of physical therapy was starting to go downhill. And I remember I was at like dinner with a bunch of JOSPT people. And I'm only saying this because I'm a sports guy, by the way. It's not that it's a bad journal. It's just not sportsy anymore. But I remember when PT was like turning into not relevant anymore. And I haven't read PT in 20 years. Right. So now I feel JOSPT is getting a little too broad for me. I'm starting to really appreciate sports health a little bit more and probably AJSM still the best, you know, British journal sports medicine is amazing. So I, so that's my first tip is stick to like four core journals and just read them every month. My second tip is I use an RSS reader still. I'm like one of the only people that remember what an RSS feed is on the internet. But every like Dewey decimal system. <laughs> yeah, right. Every journal has it's called it. Well, every website has an RSS feed, but you can you can subscribe to a service like Feedly, like F E E D L Y, Feedly. And what what you do is you get all the table of contents for the journals you want to follow, and you submit that that URL into it. And every time a new article is added, it gets it gets pinged into there. So now you have like your own like little reader. So like, that's like my routine. I'll flip open Apple news. I'll check out like some, some of the recent articles, what the stock market do that day. Let me open up Feedly. What new articles came out today? That sort of thing. That's what I would, I would recommend doing. Uh, anybody else want to jump on that? Cause I know everybody has their own style on how they stay current. I just follow authors that are in my interest areas. So like I study some weird stuff like hip micro instability and there's like four or five surgeons that are pumping out research and I just tag them in PubMed. I like that, right? And anybody do uh, topics like in uh, PubMed where you subscribe to a topic? Yeah, yeah. Dan, Dan said he did. Yeah, Dirk. I'll yeah. do that for like squat or bench press or and I've got yeah, kind of a weird niche. Go. So I, I throw them in there and they give me an alert once a month and I can look through that stuff. So yeah. Yeah. Meat, meathead journal article. I like it. Journal of meat. <laughs> 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 uh, and that's, that's usually where I, I say to do the thing. I'm going to tell you one thing not to do is do not stay current on research on Instagram. I think that's the, the worst place you do because you're just getting jaded opinions from people in a snapshot of time. I don't think that's the way to do it. So, uh, but anyway, so great question, Frank. Uh, what else we got, Nick? All right, we got Christina Jesserin. Yeah. Hey, what's up, Christina? Hey, so I had a question. I kind of piggybacked on something else, another question I saw somebody ask. Um, but I was laid off from my 
outpatient ortho PT clinic, like I'm sure a lot of people were. And so then I started kind of thinking like, well, do I really want to work there? And like, what should I do? What about, um, what are your thoughts on residencies and mentorship versus just getting a broad swath of continuing education moving forward? If you feel like you're just kind of floating along, but you're maybe not like progressing or improving or becoming the PT that you think you maybe could be as quickly as you could be. Right. I like that. I, I, I guess my biggest piece of advice to start this off with is decide what you want to get better at. And what I try to tell people to do, and I, this is a great opportunity, right? You work an outpatient, you, you actually have a little sabbatical, right? How often do we get to have a time like this? Take a step back and do a self audit and say like, what am I good at? What am I comfortable at? What am I not so comfortable at? And do I care? Right. And then, and then how can I get better at those sorts of things? And this is where, where you get to do that. And then I think the, the, the method of you achieving that doesn't matter if it's mm -hmm. through a residency, if it's through con ed courses, if it's through online courses, like, I don't think that necessarily matters, but decide, but put your energy right now into that. What I, what I don't want to see you do is blindly do some random residency just because you're not sure what to do. Right. I think I think that would be my biggest tip. Anybody else? Yeah, no, I agree. I think uh, I think um, residency could be good ground. How long you've been out of school and what your years of experience? How many years you've been out and how many you've been Three. practicing? Three. Say it again. Three. Three. Okay, so I'm, yeah, so I mean, you know your own situation of uh, taking a huge pay cut and working long hours, and you know, can that just your family sustain that um, if that's an issue? But I think self-learning and, and putting yourself in a position where you are the happiest, um, there's no guarantee that the residency is going to be that route. Um, I think we've said that over and over again on previous podcasts. It's a, a good option, but I still think some self-learning and finding that, that niche of that, that's really passionate for, I think that you're gonna, it's going to drive you a lot further than anything else, I think. Nice. Awesome. Well, thanks. Good luck. Sorry about the layoff. Yeah. Um, yeah. Right. Yeah. Good luck. Thank you. All right. We got Ian Stout is up next. Hey, Ian. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, Ian. Uh, I've been working with um, an athlete that has undergone bilateral uh, labral surgery. Um, she's about 16 weeks out, so she's doing awesome after the second one. But she's getting into more of shooting for her sport. She's a basketball player. I was wondering if you had any protocols or anything, any thoughts on returning her to her sport safely. Nice. Who wants that one? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I could start. You said bilateral, uh, or was it a revision labor repair? Um, I believe one was a little more posterior and the other one was anterior. Um, both are pretty good. One's a little more limited than the other with range of motion, but overall, yeah. Why did they do them at the same time? Yeah, I was just going to ask that. How far <laughs> apart are they doing? <laughs> it was, I believe, 16 weeks apart. Um, oh, okay. When was I think in December? <laughs> I was going to say, was this like the week before the COVID <laughs> shutdown or something? They were trying to jam them both in, in there? <laughs> I think, but yeah, Mike, you said you started start off so, here. So, uh, well, I, that was like an awkward pause, but anyway, um, they're, they're four nice. months out of labor repair nice. surgery. I guess you could start with where we hope they are and we hope that they have restored full range of motion. If they're still really tight and having trouble with overhead mobility uh, and getting up into a jump shot, I think that's definitely where you need to start um, restoring range of motion, um, soft tissue, and then dynamic stability. Uh, we probably are advancing more towards a strength and conditioning uh, program around four months. Um, we could probably do some weight bearing stuff. We could probably do some uh, pressing activities in the gym. So I think getting them generally stronger uh, and then probably working a little more high level uh, dynamic stability drills that are in relation to their sport would be something that you could try, especially if they're having trouble getting up into the shooting position. I don't know if some can get a little creative with it. Yeah. Yeah, I, 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 without seeing them being so far apart, I think, you know, the question is, is one limit the other one? Like with some of the functional things you can do, that's going to be, that's going to be the big curveball. So um, awesome. Good luck with that. That's a tough one, Ian. I, I, I don't like the complicated ones like that. That's, oof, that's, a, that's I did devil <laughs> I feel yeah, your pain. yeah, we let, we let the students work with those kind of people. Those are, those are too much, but uh, <laughs> no, but uh, awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Good one. 
Nick, while you're getting the next one, I just happened to glance up and I saw uh, Vince said, asking for a friend is keeping bad for you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the answer is yes. All right, who's next, uh, Nick? Uh, we got Steve Lutz is up next. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, what's up, Steve? Hey, uh, so what I like down there. there. Uh, yeah, first of all, you guys have been a, a really big influence in uh, the way that we treat our patients in the clinic. So uh, we really appreciate it. It's not just me. Thank it's, you. It's a whole group of about 10 guys that are really relying on your information. So Awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Steve. Thank and, you. Uh, and, uh, yeah, the question I had was um, how do you handle uh, conversations with patients after you've evaluated them? Do you try to identify a structure that's maybe irritable, like your shoulder hurts because your rotator cuff is uh, weak or there's impingement or something of that nature? And yeah. how do you discuss, like, the plan of care and uh, treatment? Yeah, we, we always, we, one of the things that we came up with at Champion, and I think it's just because we have some higher level athletes and, and even higher level, like, like ortho people, right? Like we tend to have people that want to get the most out of their bodies. That's kind of what we say a little bit. So what we kind of did with them is like our traditional physical therapy just looks at the source of the pain or the location of the pain and just like structural issues, right? We tend to say we want to look both structural and functional, right? And what I say to them and, and because I try to like, like speak in terms that like they can talk to them. It's like, all right, you came with shoulder pain. All right. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to figure out, is anything broke? Does anything need to be fixed or, or whatever? I don't, I don't say the word fix. That's weird. But like, I say like, what's, what's broke? Like what's the issue going on? And then I say, what's suboptimal? And what we're going to do is we're going to find, find what might be the issue, but then we're going to start a checklist of suboptimal. And then we're going to put that together. And when we put that together, I think that usually results in the best outcomes. And then when you have that discussion about the plan of care, it's like a breeze, right? Because you just, as you brought them through that assessment and you're saying, I know your shoulder hurts, but wow, look at, look at your thoracic spine, how it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, you know, move well, right? Like, let's play a game, like slouch down and raise up, like no good, right? Sit up tall and raise up, like way better, right? You can show them that on the fly. I think immediately they're going to have this great buy-in and they'd be like, that's Steve guy. He knows what he's talking about, right? I mean, he works on a beach. Like that guy's amazing, right? <laughs> so, and so I think that's what they're that's what they're gonna say. So uh, awesome! But thanks, Steve. Who's next? Next, thanks, Steve. All right, we got Caroline Bear. What's up, Caroline? What's up, Caroline. Hi. Caroline. What's up, Caroline? How are you? Good. How are y'all? Good, good. So I recognize you from social media too. That's up. What's going on? <laughs> I, I love seeing faces with this. I actually get to see people. This is cool. What's going on? Well, me and my classmates have definitely enjoyed this the past couple weeks, so thank you guys. Um, we were talking about one of the articles, I think it was talking about, um, they looked at New York high school baseball players, and 50% or so were saying that they believe they should have the Tommy John without even having an injury. And so we were talking about, um, like, the, just the lack of education like are you guys as PTs getting into high school systems and doing in services and just kind of letting them know that you're there and like want to help um, w along with their care and if you are doing that or know of people doing that are there any obstacles that you find with that process I, I, that's a great question I and I, that was Frank's study right Len like I am so Frank Frank's all, Frank just asked a question about the research, but that was it, you know, part of his study that did cool. that. So, so that's awesome, right? See, that's pretty cool. See, <laughs> see, Frank, people read your stuff. That's awesome, man. But uh, um, uh, yeah, it, it, um, it it's common, right? So, like us in in the rehab world, we we tend to stand on our soapboxes and try to tell the world these things, right? But nobody cares about injury prevention, right? So we did something at Champion. We tricked them. You ready for this? we give them a performance enhancement program, but you know what it is? It's the same thing, right? But don't tell them that, right? Because no, no one will buy an injury prevention program, but they will buy a performance enhancement program and we build it together. So when we give talks and we go out to the public and try to talk about this sort of thing, we talk about how to enhance their performance, how to get the most out of them. And obviously staying healthy is, is one of the ways, right? You can't, you know, they always say you can't make the team on the DL or you can't make the team in the tub, right? Back when you used to have those big, hut, uh, the big uh, jumbo uh, uh, hut tanks, uh, hut tub tanks, right? But, um, uh, you, you know, like we work it in with that, but to get in the door, I usually go that. Um, I know we get a lot of, so Dave with gymnastics, maybe, you know, I don't know, you want to comment a little bit more on that. Like how, how do you get into your, your crowd of athletes before they're injured? 
Yeah, it's very similar to kind of what Mike said. And this is, I learned this the hard way when I was, I was uh, trying to start to do more in the gymnastics world sports medicine side is like, you have your idea of the things you want to change and you want to help out with. But like Mike said, like when it comes from the user side hearing it, they don't really care. So I think the important thing is to uh, try to identify the performance issues that they know, um, you know, are going to be hot topics for them. Right. So like um, in gymnastics, like, Oh, we need to sprint faster and we need like more flexibility. So you try to like build a program that gives them kind of what they want in the beginning. And as you build more trust, maybe the second, third time you talk, say like, Hey, by the way, like, you know, if we change your strength program a little bit, like you might be able to get more power out of it. Cause like that's a hot topic in gymnastics is they don't want to externally load. So I kind of slowly kind of build a relationship and work our way in. And then finally, like, Hey, by the way, can we talk about, the way they land and like something else like that. So I would say ease in with the, the hot topics that they might latch onto. Yeah. What's up, Dan? Yeah. Not to belabor this question too much, but I think what's probably going to be helpful is to try to get in the coach's ear a little bit. Um, having been in the fitness industry, it's a little different than a sport. Uh, at least in the fitness world, a big problem is if people get hurt because they get hurt, they basically lose their business. It doesn't look good for the gym. Um, so getting in the coach's ears, building some trust and rapport with the coaches, the people that influence the actual programming that the athletes are going to be performing and just giving them an idea of what's good, what's not so good. So that they're the one distributing the information every single day. Um, because obviously the athletes are going to trust the coach or whoever is their trainer, you know, that's in front of them. Um, that's probably going to have a, a bigger impact because it's, it's hard, you know, if you're going to be working 40 hours a week as a PT, you're going to go spend your extra time, like trying to lecture in front of, you know, I don't know, auditorium of athletes that you can't really gather together. It's just hard to do that, you know? Awesome. Yeah, that's great. Nick, what did we, we got one more, one more question. Let's make it last call. It's been, an, it's been, man, it's been 90 minutes. We did this is an hour and a half. It's like a movie, right? This is awesome. <laughs> can, can we, can we even put this on, on uh, Apple podcast? I don't even know. Is, can, do they go that long? But we'll find out. We're going to, we're going to break the internet with this episode. This is going to be awesome. But <laughs> All right, Nick, last call. Let's do last question. What do we got? All right, we got Doug Geiger. What's up, Doug? Doug. Doug. Hey, guys. Um, appreciate everything that you do. And, uh, Mike, thanks for the shout-out to Jeff Lemons. He and yeah. I have known each other for 18 years, worked together. We really appreciate all the things you guys do and have put out. So, That's um, awesome. Thanks, Doug. I, yeah, my question is um, I know a former athlete, <clears throat> who's in her mid thirties now she had bilateral ACL surgery when she was in her early teens. So she's 20, 20 plus years now is having issues with arthritis. And so this kind of could probably go to anybody who's got had arthroscopic surgery, chondral impact injuries, anything along that line. But she asked me about um, stem cell therapy uh, as an option for her. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with that. So I wondered if any of you guys have had any experience with stem cell therapy, first of all, and then also what your thoughts are on it as a treatment. Um, it's pros and cons versus like Synvis injections and PRP and that kind of stuff. Anything like that short of surgery. Sure. Doug, and, and, I really want your recliner. That's all I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'll ship it to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And, and and you know what? You know what, Doug? I I feel for her too because I'd probably be thinking the same thing. So um, I I you know I I definitely have an answer, and I also saw Derek shaking his head. So I know I gotta be careful. I don't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I, I do, but uh, but I I I have some thoughts. Does anybody else want to jump in before I do? I feel like I'm I'm talking too much. No, no. I, I, I don't I mean, mind. I, I, Sorry, go ahead. Like I say, I, 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 it's not what I would jump to right away. I mean, it's just not the what I'm seeing in the research is just it hasn't. I, I think there's hope for it. I really do. That is my biology background. Um, that was my undergrad. Is I would love for it to be kind of this this wave of like we can like inject something and cartilage grows and it's like real cartilage or something. But I just, I personally, and people can chime in, but I can just definitely haven't seen it. Um, I, I mean, I'm assuming she's done a physical therapy program and you're working with her and all that. We're working on strengthening and brand some kind of unloaded brace, um, something like that, depending on with, with, where the, uh, the arthritis is in her knee, medial side versus lateral side, you can kind of unload them or some kind of heel wedges and try to unload the joint or something like that, or some kind of patella stabilization brace. Um, but I, I don't know if I would tell somebody to go get a, you know, two, three, four, five thousand dollar injection 
uh, with what I'm seeing in the research. You know what I mean? It's just, I don't think insurance is really covering that stuff. I don't think it's where I would probably send her. Pope, what do you think? Do you have any experience with this stuff? I used to work close to Centeno Schultz out in Colorado, and um, it was actually tough. I couldn't speak to the docs. I had a ton of questions. It was very new to me. Um, but they would inject stem cells everywhere. Um, and it was very expensive for the patient. And I really didn't know if it was going to be beneficial beyond physical therapy, but they did really trust physical therapy and sent us there. Um, but that being said, um, a lot of athletes and individuals that have some sort of pain or injury, oftentimes that's one of the first things they jump to. It's like, oh man, I hurt my knee. I got to get stem cells because this guy got it or this person got it. Um, so at least for me, I'm usually telling athletes, like we have to have a really comprehensive training program for you to go down that route. Right. Um, and then the other part is that at least from what I've seen, I have no idea if these athletes got better because of the stem cell injection or because of the physical therapy. So at least I can speak from that. It's all anecdote myself, but, um, yeah, I did see a lot of stem cell patients. Yeah. And, and you know, and I think that's part of what's happening right now, Doug, is that you see stuff like a pro basketball player or somebody, you know, is, is getting it done. So the general public then thinks like, Oh, I want to do that. But what they don't realize is that these guys that make millions, right. And, and tens of millions sometimes like they, um, you know, they'll, they'll do anything to, to feel better, even if it's just an incremental benefit. Right. So to them, money's no object. So like theoretically, like it's not that they thought that was going to necessarily put them over the edge. Um, I saw a, a lot of older athletes towards the end of their career start trying it, like on rotator cuffs and knees and stuff like that. And I can't say that anybody's had good outcomes from it. I don't think anyone's had anything bad either, but certainly nothing like magical, right? Um, so I, I don't know. I, I think the technology is just not there yet. But I have a lot of smart friends, right? So like some of the good physicians like at Rush that I work with a bunch with the White Sox out in Chicago, like Dr. Brian Cole, is really starting to get advanced with some of the stuff. I think that we're going to see this become valuable in our generation. I don't know what that means, but at some point in time we can, right? And I don't know, I know there's some like, there, you know, there's different things like the FDA like doesn't want us to clone humans, right? So there's like all these like restrictions on what we do with stem cells in America, right? That's why some of the athletes go to Europe to get, uh, you know, different things here. But like, it, it, that's another issue we have to face. So to answer your question is, I don't think we're there yet with stem cells. Um, I certainly, uh, you know, wouldn't do it unless she had just like a huge, uh, you know, financial uh, bank account in the background. I think same thing with PRP. That's probably not going to be your answer either. Uh, maybe some CBD oil. I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I mean, I, I just, I don't know if there's something magical and I know she's grasping for stuff. I think we just, we do the best we can to just get her to be able to absorb that load, maybe offload it. Like Lenny kind of said, and unless she has infinite money, probably say like, we're probably not ready for that yet. Great. Cool. Appreciate awesome. it guys. Thanks, yeah. Doug. Appreciate Thanks it. Doug. Thanks Doug. And and thank all of you guys, really. Honestly, that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much for coming out for something like this. Lots of good faces that we recognize. Lots of good friends, former students and interns, everybody kind of joining us here. Thanks again, because we're doing this for you, right? We hate listening to ourselves speak. I'll be, I'll be the first to tell you that. So we're doing it for you, right? So I, I have to sit down after we record these and, and prep them to get them uh, uh, ready for production and stuff like that. So I have to listen to them more than once and it's awful, right? So thank you so much. It's, we hate listening to ourselves. So thank you so much for being part of this journey with us. Uh, maybe we'll do this again on the 400th episode. What do you guys think? Will we, wow. think, we'll, think we'll be around for that? I mean, four years from now. Who knows? What to I, I, right? um, that'd be awesome. But thanks again. And, uh, uh, and, and this was amazing. So keep spreading the word. You know, if you're a student or a new grad or something, like, you know, get your friends involved because – I know a lot of them probably have very similar questions that you have here. So if we can answer some of the things that maybe they have some doubt on and some overwhelm, then, then that'd be fantastic. So let's do this. Let's end with the world's largest internet social distancing elbow bump. Let's all do this together. This is going to be the screenshot of our, uh, <laughs> of, of the uh, podcast episode. So awesome. Thanks everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Thanks guys. guys. It's a lot of fun. Thank you.